It's time now for perspective. This past year and a half, a lot of us have had more time than usual to think, with many using successive lockdowns and curfews to ask some of the big questions in life. And while you might not have been thinking about your personal problems in terms of Schopenhauer's conception of compassion or the metaphysics of nothing, philosophy nonetheless provides a fascinating lens through which to examine the way we live our lives. My guest today is Nigel Warburton, philosopher and creator of the hugely successful podcast Philosophy Bites. He's also the author of a number of books, including A Little History of Philosophy. Thank you very much indeed for speaking to us here on France 24 today. Now, many people do see philosophy as a purely academic subject, but you're bringing it to the masses. What can normal people get from embracing the study of philosophy, do you think? Well, I think everybody studies philosophy in some sense, in the sense that they think about things that matter to them. They think about how they should live. Uh, they think about whether there's a God. They worry about what the nature of reality is these days. So we're all philosophers to some extent, but there is this uh, more than 2,000 years of Western philosophy, but a far longer history than that, which has been academic and has focused on um, quite quite uh, technical questions quite often these days. Um, so I think everybody has an interest in philosophy in the sense that we all care about how we live. Everybody does, whether they say it or whether they just do it. We've all got an interest in that. Now, we have all experienced, as I mentioned just then, a rather extraordinary 18 months uh, with, of course, the COVID-19 global pandemic. Are there any ideas, any philosophies that you have found particularly useful to recall this past year and a half? Occasionally, I've drawn on stoicism, uh, the idea that <laughs> there are some things beyond our control and the, the best way to live when there are those things that are, are actually beyond your control is to focus on the things that are within your power to change. So if you can't control whether there's going to be a lockdown, personally, probably, unless you're Boris Johnson or Macron, um, but you can control how you react to that. You can control, to some extent, um, how you live your life within that framework. Uh, and not worry about those other things. That's easy easy to say. And um, stoicism is sometimes caricatured as a, a view where you uh, withdraw your human, normal human emotions from the frame and just focus on the, being a kind of um, robot-like um, person who, who doesn't get overly upset about the way the world is if it's beyond your power to change it. Um, but occasionally it is a very useful strategy and it's been, um, been useful this year for sure. And people, I certainly have, been shocked to a certain extent at how easily we've accepted restrictions on our personal freedoms uh, this past year and a half. Is that something that you as a philosopher have found interesting to look at? Uh, well, it's fascinating. People accept, but also people react in strange ways. I don't know um, I find I find it strange, actually, the degree to which there's paranoia and and um, conspiracy theories about why we're really being locked down when the scientific evidence worldwide is so strong about the benefits of not meeting people and and, and exchanging viruses too much. Um, there is this element of people accepting, but there's also a protest movement. I'm all for protest and the and the within le a legal framework and for the for the diversity of opinions and so on. But but what's slightly worrying is that some of those protests have been extremely aggressive and actually deliberately defied um, people in a way that is likely to spread the virus. Um, that that's quite disturbing. Also also the the way in which um, people are being manipulated to some extent by news. I mean, you're part of this, presumably. There's, there's a control of the news that gets out, and that's quite disturbing. But fortunately, we have the internet, and many of us have found other ways of finding out what's going on. And do you think the internet is to some extent to blame for the fact that these alternative realities are, are being spread faster than they have been in, in the past? Well, it's, and I've benefited hugely from the internet because the podcast series that I make with David Edmonds, Philosophy Bites, is distributed on the on the internet. There are lots of th good things on the internet, but obviously it has the power for great harm as well. And this is a kind of cliche, but what it allows people to do is to find other people like them. So I've been lucky enough to find lots of people who like who enjoy philosophy across the world through the internet, but at the same time, if I'd had some weird um, cult-like view, I might have found the other people in the world who share that with me. Um, 
and linked up with them quite easily. And that's one of the um, features of the internet, that the, in the internet's relatively neutral, that um, has helped some um, extreme views to, to grow and flourish uh, um, and promulgate um, anti-scientific, anti-vax ideas in a, in a bigger way. But fortunately, the other thing that the internet allows is a kind of interaction, which allows for other views to be circulated, and, and there is a counter view going out. So I'm very much in favour of free expression, and, and I've written about this, and, and I, I still think that, um, in general, having extensive free expression is the way forward, despite the risks of that, associ that are associated with that. And some people do talk about, you know, the uh, the the woke culture uh, going on a cancelling rampage. Is that something that concerns you as a proponent of freedom of speech, of freedom of expression? Robust disagreement is fine. Um, protest is fine within limits. Um, I've been worried that some people get closed down and some people are not prepared to listen to the other side. And another kind of cliche is there's a kind of is a hydraulic model, if you like. If you suppress somebody else's thought, it might and and, and spoken um, expression of their views. There's a risk it'll come out in some some other way. Um, I think there have been some very interesting developments in the last um, decade in, in in terms of anti-racism, in terms of um, tolerance of, of a wide range of different sexualities, of the whole issue about trans issues, and there's been a really interesting. Um, ongoing debate with with views that haven't previously been heard much getting getting in the fore, but when that involves shutting down other people's ideas extensively, I do start to worry. Yes, I'm so sorry. We could talk about this for a very long time, but we have just run out of time. Uh, Nigel Warburton, philosopher and creator of the hugely successful podcast Philosophy Bites. Thank you very much for speaking to us today. Thank you.